Good evening and welcome to Nightlight. I'm Barb Dumont, your host. I invite you to step away from the mainstream and gather around as we enlighten the world with our realities and travel this cosmic journey we call life. Join us as we share with you and provide that beacon that can guide us all to a better way. Explore with us as we examine a metaphysical montage of spiritual insights covering everything from the mundane to the magical, UFOs to unicorns, and everything in between. Nightlight, a reminder <clears throat> that you are never alone. Tonight I welcome back uh, one of my favorite authors. His name is Robert Sullivan, and he is uh, the author of two of my favorite books, and, and uh, it appears that he has two or three more coming. He wrote, the cinema, he wrote Cinema Symbolism, a guide to esoteric imagery in popular movies. And um, it's a big title, but it changed the way that I looked at movies forever. In a scary way sometimes, in a, in a pleasant way other times, in, in many ways because I come from a, a spiritual background and, and am constantly on that journey of self-awareness, he gave me tools that that changed the way I look at not only movies, but television and advertising. I made me far more aware of the subtle manipulation that is that is incorporated into everything we look at, that we listen to, and that is around us. It's, it was an amazing journey for me. The second book that he wrote, and I'm not sure which order they came in, but the second book that I that challenged me is The Royal... Arch of Enoch, the impact of Masonic ritual, philosophy, and symbolism. Now, um, uh, it, it, it intimidated me greatly, and the first time I started to read it, I found that I was in over my head, which, which for me is not unusual, but it was a challenge for me. And after putting myself through uh, a self-imposed study of Freemasonry, I, I opened the book again with a far greater appreciation and understanding of, of what the Masonic orders do, especially um, as you get past the Blue Lodge into the Scottish Rites and the York Rites. Um, the amazing amount of material, insight, wisdom, and spirituality, spirituality that is involved in, in that particular organization blew my mind away and and it taught me a lesson just because I don't know about something doesn't mean it doesn't have something in it that, that can change my life profoundly and this book actually did and, and I'm so appreciative to Robert for these two books because being in my field for as long as I've been in it I every now and then think oh there's not much else here that I can dive into and and he reminded me tremendously of how little I really know about the world around me and how greatly so many things that I have taken for granted actually in, in you know impact my reality to the to the point of understanding more deeply what people are trying to say and where they are coming from and he has stretched my horizons uh, he has two books or three books, two or three books. We'll have to ask him, but I know he's coming out very shortly with Cinema Symbolism 2, more esoteric imagery uh, from popular movies, as well as his first book on fiction, A Pact with the Devil, the story of Elizabeth Byrne Black and her involvement with the occult black magic and the dark arts. And there's also, I believe, another one coming out on Masonry uh, entitled Freemasonry and the Path to Babylon. Uh, I got to tell you, anybody who has not studied Freemasonry, who thinks they know it all, should really do some, some personal studying and then look into his books because um, Freemasonry is an aspect of our society today that... that it's it's kind of like a lot of things. It's always been there. We take it for granted and we think we know it all. And when you look into it, when you do a study of Freemasonry, not only where it came from, but what it involves, and especially the degrees that go beyond the, the Blue Lodge, which is the first three levels, uh, it's fascinating. And it's a study in history and it's a study in the development of a spiritual practice that 
that is not publicized, it is not advertised, but it is there within our society. And it's it has given me much greater appreciation of anyone who decides to, to do the further study. And um, so with that, I'll welcome Robert to the show. Hi, Robert. I'm glad you're here. Hi, Barbara. Thanks for having me back on Nightlight, now on uh, Revolution Radio Studio B. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, wow, what wonderful introduction. Thank you so much. Uh, looking forward to tonight's show. Me too. And, you know, it's, it is a, a new audience for me. So it, it means that, that we can go over some of the things that, you know, I, I have to tell you, I loved Cinema Symbolism. I mean, the, it's a fabulous book. And, and, I, and, and the, the Arch of Enoch as well. So that, so that uh, you know, we can go in, in so many different directions. But I think I want to start out with, frankly, um, did I get all of your new books right, by the way? Yeah, I, th- I think so. Um, the 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 movie book, um, the sequel to Cinema Symbolism is, I think you got it right, Cinema, Cinema Symbolism 2, more esoteric imagery in popular movies. you got the work of fiction right. Uh, th- those are the, really the two next ones that will be coming out. Um, the Masonic book, the third Masonic book, Freemasonry, in the, or the, it's the third book, it's the second Masonic book. That, that's still probably... Um, I mean, that, that's a couple of years away um, e- easily. But the Cinema Symbolism 2 and the Pact with the Devil fiction, uh, work of fiction, those should be out later this year. That's so cool. And for those of you who I, I have a couple of friends that when I said esoteric, they said, well, esoteric, exoteric. And, and at the esoteric are those um, those those secret meanings that, that not everyone is is uh, has available to them. So it's secret secret symbology that has been woven into things like the movies and advertising and television. And um, it, it's, it's an amazing tool that I never knew existed until I, I read the, uh, the, the symbolism one book, because I thought I, you know, I, I love movies. I go to them a lot. I never realized the, the, um, the, the, the degree with which, I mean, I I could I caught it when I saw you know Apple computers and Coca Cola signs and stuff like that. I knew they had paid to advertise within the movie itself. I got that, and I thought, well, that's all it is. But it goes so much deeper. It's unbelievable. And uh, one of the things that that profoundly has has influenced me in the way I look at things is how we are we come into this this reality pre-programmed with archetypes that we don't even realize most of us yeah well that's right um and a lot of these movies um really resurrect these archetypes from the subconscious mind um you know we we are you know and and th- this was very um critical to me when i was writing the book was to delve into the world of carl Jung, um the collective unconscious the archetypes the solar savior the lunar heroine um the trickster the father the mother um the lover Uh, These are all very powerful archetypes coming out of the collective unconscious. This was developed by Carl Gustav Jung. This comes from the world of, of, um, of uh, Plato, uh, the the philosopher. He, he developed a a similar, similar theorem. He called it the theory of forms. Um, It, it, it it mirrors uh, Jung's collective unconscious. And in in a a nutshell, it's the, that these archetypal figures um, are just, are just, you know, integrated in, in part of us since day one. Um, and, and, you know, you, you can look at it one of two ways is that the movie, it's probably a combination of both If the movie makers are aware of this. So you, you will find these architect types, excuse me, um, repeating themselves over and over again in cinema. Um, well, alternatively, you, you can look at it in, in, from, from the standpoint, I think both standpoints are correct. Um, you know, you can look at it from the standpoint also of, well, the movie makers are, um, the movie makers are subject to this too, the directors, the producers. So we have, you know, the parallels, you know, with Luke Skywalker or, you know, uh, you know, you know, Frodo Baggins or Neo, you know, or Paul Atreides, um, you know, the, the, the monomyth, you know, you, you, you'll find these characters turning up over and over again, um, just with different names on them. Um, and, and it's a fascinating study. I delve into this in, in cinema symbolism. I, I, of course, I didn't want to rewrite cinema symbolism all over again, but it's unavoidable when you're dealing with archetypes and archetypal imagery. You'll find this, of course, in, in, in the, some of the movies that I'm taking on in cinema symbolism, too. It's completely unavoidable, the monomyth, things like that. 
um, you know, you know, I know you kind of just wanted to kind of leave this as an open conversation. Certainly anything you want to ask me, it's, it's funny. I'll just, I'll just end on this with cinema symbolism and the archetypes and writing cinema symbolism too. And I, I don't know if what I'm going to say really even makes sense. I think it does. When, 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 when I'm, I'm writing cinema symbolism too now, and I would probably say I'm at least 85, 90% through it. Um, it, it's, it's really all that's left is the Harry Potter, Harry Potter stories. Pretty much everything else is done. There, there's a couple more things i got to tweak here and there, but by and large, the book is done except for the Harry Potter movies. I saved them for the very end. But when I was, write, when I'm, when I was writing this, um, I think, and I don't know this for certain, but I think that if you read Cinema Symbolism 1 and then you turn around and read Cinema Symbolism 2, I think you will have a better understanding of some of the material in Cinema Symbolism 1. Um, that, that's what I'm getting out of all of this. But Cinema Symbolism 2 is coming along, and certainly Cinema Symbolism 1 is out right now, so with Royal Arch of Enoch. So, um, yeah, I mean, archetypal imagery, you know, it, it's part of Cinema Symbolism. And, uh, I, of course, you know, this is something I completely revisit um, to a certain degree um, in Cinema Symbolism 2. Well, it, it's funny because I've recently done a lot of work on on our DNA and how much of it they call junk DNA and, and how much of it, um, if you look esoterically into it, it it's the storehouse of, of probably where the archetypes come from. Park, you know, there's past life stuff there. There's all sorts of memories there. And today as a society, there is a greater awakening and understanding of the esoteric arts and and the concepts that they hold and how they can awaken with us a greater awareness of not only our reality but our place within reality and and i would say that that you're you're identifying them and putting them out there for people to understand that there are literally roles that we have an understanding of that are implanted within us before we start to even grow and assimilate knowledge and wisdom from this reality this lifetime so um it it for me coming from the spiritual aspect of it 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 broadens and awakens so much more signifying that we as a society, as a, as a race, as a species, are moving into a greater understanding of other aspects of our reality. And that means we're awakening up, uh, awakening. And it means that, that, that we are capable of so much more understanding that, that not only can you apply it to the movies and to television and to advertisements and things like that, but, but to our everyday life. So what you're putting out there is of such great wealth that it's, it's not just understanding movies, it's understanding life better. And, and I'm, yeah. I'm sure, I don't know that it was meant to be a teaching tool like that, but in my opinion, it has become one. Yeah. I mean, I think, I, I, I don't know if I intended it for that, but I understand what you're saying. I think, you know, that by it's sort of like you know, the kind of like uh, art imitating life, imitating, you know, art almost where understanding the movies, the movies are a reflection of ourselves. So if you understand the psychological, the archetypes, in a way you're understanding society and the world around you better. Um, that's certainly, you know, I, I mean, I, I, I don't know if I consciously intended that, but it's certainly, I'm, I'm glad it had that effect. Um, you know, and, and uh, you know, any, any time, you know, you can affect someone positively, even a way that you may not have in, intended, um, certainly, you know, p people – um, re read the books, um, read cinema symbolism, and they can read Royal Arch. And I suspect that someone may take something away from it um, completely different than someone else, um, you know, may take away. You know, so someone someone may have a greater understanding of something or someone else may read a, read a different portion and have a greater understanding of something completely different. Um, well, kind, yeah, kind of but... just real, yeah, just to kind of reverse this almost, um, you know, it, it is. I mean, there, there were some parts – just real fast, I, there were some parts of Royal Arch of Enoch that I thought were very controversial, um, and they would, may have gotten me into some trouble, and it was actually, I found out that there was other parts of it that were more upsetting to people than the parts I originally intended. So, yeah, I mean, you could definitely um, read it and take different things away from it, but certainly what you're saying, um, I'm certainly glad that it had that effect. Um, that, that, that was, uh, that's wonderful to hear. Well, I think that, in my opinion, uh, and of course my opinion changes from day to day, so you know, don't carve anything in stone, folks. But, it, but in my opinion, um, the the um, the tools that you give I here apply to all aspects of life. And when 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 people pick up a book, it has to, in some way, 
talk to their their um, you know their, their their base of knowledge their you know just what it is that they have inside of them that allows them to understand something and for me I I always look for that 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 element that that touches into the things that I've studied, the things that I am interested in, and the things that that relate to me. So it's a it's a matter of you know you, you once you hit that, then then you get the reader. Now most people have seen a lot of the movies that you've analyzed, and we will go into a lot of them. But going back to the the Arch of Enoch, um, when I hit Enoch, and when I hit you know his journey. And then Solomon, the building of Solomon's temple and, and the Hiram Abiff stuff, um, I suddenly had the frame of reference that I could click into that could kind of, you, you know, you need to have something that you can attach to in your frame of reference in order to make something flow and be understanding to you. So, um, you know, and, and that's coming from a, a more spiritual background and not knowing a great deal about uh, Freemasonry. That's where you got me. And well, no, that's yeah, that's good to hear. No, I mean, it's it was definitely. Um, I mean, I, I think there was a lot. I do believe there was a lot of spirituality in, in the Royal Arch of Enoch book. And I think for me, for both books, it was really, um, you know, I, I didn't want to rehash. You know, I, 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 I do genuinely believe um, that the books are, you know, you know, do, do, do they do they have foundational building that, you know, yeah, absolutely. I do believe by and large, both books say stuff that is completely new. I, I could, I, I mean, I, I put, you know, with, with Royal Arch and kind of, which also was, was born, Cinema Symbol was kind of born out of, this was 20 years of research. And I mean, when I was doing both books, Royal Arch first, Cinema Symbolism second, I mean, I, I really did believe in my heart of hearts. And I still believe this to this day that the books are saying original things. Um, contain information that you're not going to find anywhere else. That was very, very important to me um, in, in doing that. I, I didn't. I mean, you know, you have to have building blocks where you can rely on, like the Manly P. Halls and the Albert Pikes and things like that. But I really wanted that, you know, come at this with new material. Um, but of course, you know, I wanted to to dovetail with the historical fact, of course. Um, oh, I mean, gosh, I, you yeah. Know, same, yeah, I mean, same thing with the movies. I didn't want to say outrageous things that I couldn't didn't, didn't have a basis in reality. Um, and I was real happy with the way, way uh, the, 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 the two books came out. Um, and like I said, I'm real happy with the way cinema symbolism is coming out right now. And uh, certainly my fir first work of fiction, that, uh, that obviously is going to be a little bit different than the other two. Um, you know, you, you can't write a work of fiction like the Royal Arch of Enoch. But um, no, um, I, I'm, real, yeah, I'm real pleased with the way they came out. And uh, I'm real happy with the way the, uh, the two I'm writing right now are turning out. Well, for Cinema 3, I have two, two movies I vote for. One is Avatar and the other one is Avatar and the other is Interstellar. Um, you know, I, yeah, that's right. I remember you mentioned those the last time. No, I, yeah, th those will have to be in Cinema Symbolism three, no question about it. Um, it's it's funny because this happened to me on Cinema Symbolism one, and it just happened to me on Cinema Symbolism two. Was when I was writing Cinema Symbolism one, the one that's out now, there were movies in that that I wanted to talk about, but I thought, you know, it's the same thing. You know, this book will never end; it'll go on forever. So I thought, okay, I'll, I'll put these in Cinema Symbolism two. So sure enough, I'm writing Cinema Symbolism 2, and I'm looking at this, and I'm thinking, oh, you know, here we go again. There's movies I want to talk about in Cinema Symbolism 2. I mean, there's just no way the book will go on forever. So I'm, I'm kind of already beginning to plot Cinema Symbolism 3. And believe me, um, Interstellar, you're not the only person who's come asking me about that one. So, so that, that'll definitely have to go in. You know, you, know, you mentioned Avatar to me, and I, I've... You know, I I have seen that. That was the James Cameron one, but it's been about it's been years since I've seen it, so that's definitely gonna have to take a look. Uh, have to take another look at it. I have yet to see Interstellar, but uh, oh. you know, definitely, I, I've had a couple other people come at me with that one. So yeah, definitely on the uh, list for uh, Cinema Symbolism three. Well, I I think you know just so that so that people understand where this comes from and how it fits in into um, the movies. Uh, the the archetypes that that are inside of us are are archetypes that that we recognize subliminally, if not consciously, so that it gives us a greater understanding to the the part that someone is playing and what they represent within the movie. And once you've got that, and, and not every movie fits every archetype, but for the most part they do. And directors and writers are aware of those archetypes, at, le at least the ones that are 
you know, that have, you know, ex that are very, very, very popular. Um, the easiest one, I think, um, I'm trying to think of what, I, I guess the exorcist is the one that, that really represents things um, most easily and most people have seen. So can we kind of go into understanding um, the exorcist and, and how these archetypes apply and, and how they have used settings and our memories of what the settings represent to give us an idea as to where the movie is going and things like that? Yeah, absolutely. The Exorcist is probably, this is a movie that I cover in Cinema Symbolism 1. This, this is out now. It's actually the first chapter of the book um, is The Exorcist. And it, it's, a very, it's, a, it's a movie that's very rich in symbolism. Um, even more so, I, I, it's one of my all-time favorites. Um, and and it, it's very rich in symbolism. I, I've seen the movie uh, dozens of times. Um, I'm going to have it here on Blu-ray. I have the director's cut here on Blu-ray. Um, and and I, knew, I knew there was some in it, but I, when I was really applying this to cinema symbolism when I was writing it and was really sort of sitting down watching this, this movie through my, you know, quote unquote symbolic goggles. There was really a lot more. It, it became apparent to me that there was really a lot more going on inside this movie than, than even I thought so at first. So just, so just we'll break down the exorcist a little bit. I mean, you have um, the whole idea of, I mean, you know, you know, you, there's so much we could go into with this. Um, you have the one priest, um, the, the father, Karis, Damien Karis, the Jesuit, um, you know, he is the little girl's, you know, it, it's the Christ figure. It's, it's the savior figure. Um, mm -hmm. He is going to be her savior figure um, in the movie. He's the Jesuit. You have the little girl being possessed by the dark demon. Um, you know, you have the, so, you know, you, you, to expel the darkness, you got to call him the solar priest. Um, and the Jesuits, you know, you know, you take a look at their logo, it's the sun. So you have this whole idea of, you know, Manichaean cosmology, Zoroastrianism and Christianity. This is, you know, God versus the devil, light versus dark. Um, so you have the sun battling darkness. Um, the one thing that's very archetypical in, in the, in the, um, that this does come out of the world of the collective unconscious is with the little girl, when the evil takes possession of her, it becomes drastically cold. Um, you know, you can see her breath when, when the priests enter at the end, you know, you can see her breath and, and the director showing you how I, frigid is in, frigid it is in the bedroom. Um, this comes out of the world of Dante Alighieri's Inferno, um, the whole notion of, of hell and the demons in hell being in a frigid wasteland. So, of course, when they come up to possess the human, they bring this icy, frigid um, coldness with them. This is, of course, the ninth circle of hell from Dante's Inferno. Um, you have the Damien Karras figure being the Christ Savior archetype. Um, to convey this, this is very subtly done. Um, you, right off the bat, you know, you know, Karras is by and large in that movie in, in a state of ascension. He's constantly walking up hills, walking up staircases. In fact, when he's introduced in the movie, he's seen coming up a flight of steps, um, and, and you, you actually see him. He's coming up a flight of steps onto a subway platform. You pay attention to this very closely. Um, there's a sign uh, hanging behind him, and he's coming up on 33rd Street, of all things, um, and that is a direct reference to uh, Jesus Christ, um, who was here on Earth for 33 years. So right off the bat, you have this nexus being formed with um, Jesus, with the Damien Karras figure. Um, and of course, at the end, he 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 does expel um, the the um, the demon the, the the demon from the little girl Reagan McNeil, played by Linda Blair. Um, but of course, he falls down the flight of steps at the end, killing himself, um, you know, or you know, dying at the very end. And it, 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 this whole idea of him falling down at the end is is representing is represent is representative of his doubt about Christianity um, that permeates the movie. I mean, he's constantly in doubt. He's constantly unsure of himself. And and you know you know so he falls down the flight of the steps at the end. But we know the exorcism is is successful. How do we know this? Well, when Karis is laying there at the end, you're gonna have to pay attention. Next to him on the wall, the word pigs is spray painted. Um, and this is a reference to the is very well placed. Um, this is a reference. And again, you, you know, you will not see it, but your subconscious mind will pick up on this um, is this is a reference to the gospel tale of Jesus 
um, oh, exercising yeah. the 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 demon from the man, casting them into a herd of pigs, casting them off the off the cliff. So the, the word pigs appearing there is a reference to Jesus successfully performing the exorcism in the New Testament. So hence, Charis has successfully exorcised the demon. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a ton more going on. Another, you know, archetypical imagery going on in this, and this was a great one. Um, and I've watched this scene 500 times. Um, is the scene where Chris McNeil, the mother is in the Barringer Clinic. This is the mental institution. I um, mean, she's sitting at the head of the table, and this is where the doctors are informing her that, um, that a spiritual cure is needed uh, for, for the daughter. They don't know what's wrong with her. You know, all their tests haven't worked. Um, they don't know really what's medically wrong with her, so they're, repre- they're, they're recommending to her a spiritual cure. You pay a very close attention to this. You have Chris McNeil, Chris Christ at the head of the table, and she's actually surrounded by 12 doctors um, oh, broken wow. down into four, into four groups of three. Um, and what, what Friedkin is drawing upon is the Last Supper painting um, mm-hmm. by Leonardo da Vinci. So it's, it's a lot of archetypical imagery in The, in the Exorcist. Um, it's great symbolism. I, I have a whole chapter on it, and it's actually the first chapter of, of cinema symbolism. It's one of my all-time favorite movies, um, certainly one of my all-time favorite horror movies. Um, it's a great study in, in symbolism, archetypes, archetypal imagery. Um, and I'm just, you know, I mean, I can keep going on with it, but, um, you know, we, we have a limited show, of course, but yes. the exorcist is, a, yeah, the exorcist is a movie I took on in cinema symbolism, rich in symbolism. Well, it also, you know, that scene, you know, you have 12 people at the table and those are the 12 astrological signs as well. Oh, absolutely. Um, th- this is something that I talk about much more in, in, um, the Royal Arch of Enoch, um, I talk about it also in Cinema Symbolism. I'm actually revisiting this in Cinema Symbolism too. I actually, I actually have a section in Cinema Symbolism too on um, religious cinema. Um, you know, uh, you know, like the Passion of the Christ movie and the Ten Commandments, and how these movies are all mirroring this astrological, you know, mysterion that you will find in the Bible. So, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you get into comparative religion. You have Jesus as the Sun, S U N. The apostles would be the twelve houses of the zodiac. Um, you will find these um, parallels, these astrological solar, you know, you know, parallels going on inside the Bible. Um, you know, you know, reflected in Christianity, reflected in Judaism, even believe it or not, reflected in Islam to a certain extent. Um, this is a really a deep comparative religion study that I delve into in Royal Arch of Enoch. I talk about it because it does turn up in movies, but in cinema symbolism too, I'm actually doing a whole chapter on, re- on you know, this astrological symbolism in religious cinema. Well, I think also the thing that, that, that most people don't understand is that, that the imagery that is there that wakes up these, these subliminal archetypes goes, it, it goes about into the occult, into numerology, into as, astrology, into mythologically and alchem, alchemical stuff, tarot and Kabbalistic iconic, you know, I mean, it's all in there. And it's, it's, you know, I used, I used to say to people, I, I go to the movies to be entertained. I don't go to the movies to be, you know, educated. I, you know, I like big explosions, but, 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 yeah. but now I go to the movies and, and I look for, okay, where are their symbols here? You know, I, and I will, I will usually see a movie more than once. And, and you know, if I like it and, and, you know, when you see it for a second and a third time, you, you begin to notice where the subtleties are and they are definitely in a plant on top of the advertisements that are blatant. Um, there, there is symbology, whether it's, whether it has to do with, with numerology, which, which is another ancient form of spirituality or, or utilization of spirituality, I guess is a better way to put it. Um, it's there. And so is the, the, the astrological stuff. Um, it's, it's there. And, I do believe that those who have done popular movies or books or whatever have incorporated those those archetypes into what they've written intentionally so that it will grab people. It isn't just that. It's it's a well-written book and that the, the author obviously has a love affair with words. I mean, that's that's that'll get me as well. But but after that it's like okay, I can reread it and find other places. And, and now I actually look for those subtleties 
um, to, to sort of give me a deeper understanding of what the author was really going for. Quite often, um, you know, things that we have been to that, that we have found were just entertaining turn out to be really a repeat of the story of the Bible without us even knowing it. Oh, Which, sure. Um, uh, absolutely. I mean, but you, you talk, you know, I mean, absolutely, you know, when you're getting into the archetypes, I mean, you know, th this is all being framed in with occult symbolism with, you know, I mean, you're absolutely right with numerology, with Kabbalah. Um, absolutely. I mean, I, I totally agree with that. Um, and, and, you know, it, it's really depending on what's being presented in the film. It's a contextual breakdown for me, um, breaking down the movie on the correct, you know, esoteric level. Um, but but absolutely, I mean, you know, you you, you know, you, a, lot, a lot of times, you know, like the, the Christ story, um, you know, I mean, th th this turns up over and over again. Uh -huh. um, but I mean, it, it's not it's not really, you know, it's there, but you may miss it. Um, it it's 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 you know you you know you, you know you'll find components of this um, all over the place. Um, I mean, Superman, you know, the only begotten son sent from the heavens um, to you know use miraculous powers to save mankind from itself. Um, you know, who Definitely. does battle with Lex, you know, does battle with Lex Luthor, Lucifer, you know, Lex Luthor. Yeah. Um, you know, you have, I mean, the one, the one, I mean, classic, um, I mean, if you, you know, you, you want to see the, you know, the, the, you know, the, the idea of the savior figure, you know, I, I call him the Gnostic savior, um, you know, the, the, the savior who's going to liberate mankind, you know, we turn to, um, you know, Matrix, uh, Neo, um, you know, who, who is the one, you know, I mean, what's Jesus, you know, the chosen one, uh -huh. um, you know, you know, who's going to liberate mankind and, and, you know, defeat the machines and bring gnosis to mankind. And, you know, I mean, Neo is killed and resurrected and, uh, you know, hangs around with the sacred feminine Trinity. Uh, you know, I mean, it, it's, you know, it does battle with the works of darkness, the, the, the dark evil machines, the agents. Um, absolutely. I mean, uh, the, the, the other one is, um, the, what this, we were talking about this earlier today, um, Frank Herbert's Dune, oh, um, yeah. you know, you know, you know, Paul Atreides, um, the Fremen's chosen Messiah who is going to defeat, you know, you know, the Harkonnens and, and bring peace to, um, you know, and bring peace to the universe. It's the, it's the same story over and over again. Um, and, well, and yeah, I mean, it, it's definitely there. No question. Let's look at the Lord of the Rings too. Uh, again, one of my favorite books. Tolkien, you know, Tolkien was amazing. But but there's all sorts of amazing symbolism. In, I mean, the One Ring controls them all. I mean, it, it goes on and on. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, this is something I really, you know, we, we bring up Lord of the Rings. I mean, that this is really you, you know, you get into like the Frodo Baggins character, the Luke Skywalker character you know, Paul Atreides, Neo in the Matrix. These are all characters who experience the monomyth of, of Joseph Campbell, um, the hero's journey. Um, this is something I kind of really wrestled with um, and something I wanted to talk about in Cinema Symbolism too is because the, these stories very much parallel each other. But I, I, was, I was stuck with, I was researching this, I was stuck with this idea of, you know, what, why is it that, um, you know, all four of these characters um, experience the Campbell monomyth. But why is it that Neo, um, you know, why is it that, that, that Neo, that Luke Skywalker and Frodo Baggins aren't, I mean, they're savior figures, but they're kind of different than, you know, like Paul Atreides or, or Neo. And I finally figured this out. Um, and it's, it's really that even though all four characters are always savior figures, Luke Skywalker and Frodo Baggins are not really what I would call um, spiritual liberators. <laughs> um, I mean, it's true they, 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 they defeat dark evil lords, but, you know, after the story's over, I mean, take for instance, like at the end of Return of the Jedi, I mean, Luke Skywalker disappears. At the end of Lord of the Rings, Frodo Baggin goes back to his farm in, in Shireton. Um, this isn't the case with Neo and Paul Atreides. These guys are Gnostic saviors who are going to bring Gnosis to, you know, every corner of the universe and really liberate everybody. You don't really find that in Star Wars and in, in, in Lord of the Rings. But no, um, Lord, you know, it's, it's, this is something that I really was wrestling with. But I think that's really the answer. And it's also interesting that, um, and I think this has to do with death and rebirth, and it's sort of like the Christ story. Um, and it, it, it does tie into this. It's interesting that both Paul Atreides and Dune and um, Anderson, Thomas Anderson, not only are they this, these Christ saviors, but they also undergo a name change. Um, and you don't find this with Luke Skywalker or Frodo Baggins. Um, Paul Atreides becomes Moadib or Usul, 
And, um, of course, Thomas Anderson becomes Neo. So this, again, is signifying this death and rebirth uh, motif. But, no, Lord of the Rings by J.R. Tolkien, um, this is a string of movies that I took on um, in Cinema Symbolism. I was originally going to do the um, Hobbit movies uh, for Cinema Symbolism 2, but, again, didn't fit in, so that'll have to be in Cinema Symbolism 3. Although I did, in Cinema Symbolism 2, I am doing the um, Narnia stories of uh, Lewis. But no, um, I mean, very high fantasy um, stories. I mean, the One Ring, the Dark Evil Lord. I mean, loads of elements of the monomyth with um, Joseph Campbell. I mean, we have our Sacred Feminine with Galadriel. I mean, of course, jumping off the screen of us is, is one of my, my all-time favorite archetypes, the Hermes Trismegistus archetype, the, the wizard. Um, you know, the hermit, the old gray beard, of course, Gandalf the gray, you know, I mean, you want to get into comparative, you know, comparative study of this. I mean, this is Obi-Wan Kenobi in Star Wars. Oh, yeah. Um, this is, you know, this is Morpheus in Lord of the Rings, ha- Albus Dumbledore in, in Harry Potter. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I've seen some, some great archetypical Im- imagery there as well. Um, and again, with, with Frodo, it, it's the idea, you know, of, of the figure being plucked out of the commonplace you know, being put on this giant monomythic quest to save in, in a savior role, um, and you know, in, in the end, trying to find himself. It, it, it's a great story. Um, I mean, I love the Lord of the Rings movies. I, I think they are just so well done. Um, and and I, you know, it was just, uh, you know, I mean, I mean T- Tolkien was a linguist at Christchurch. I mean, you, you you'll find all kind of mythological. I mean, references with the whole idea of the one ring. I mean, you could, you could turn to the world of um, Richard Wagner with this, you know, with, with the, the ring cycle operas, you know, um, Das Ringgold, you know, Die Valkyrie. Um, the, the, these are all, you know, circle around a magical ring of some kind. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, you have, yeah, I mean, I mean you, you, you know, you will see in, in, in Lord of the Rings, I mean, you know, the horsemen are clearly mirroring, mirroring you know, the Vikings, um, you know, this Nordic race. Um, you know, you have the, the dwarves, um, and I'm certainly not saying this to be racist or anything like that. I mean, Tolkien talked about this, I mean, who are the, you know, the, the, the sort of the, the, the Jewish race, um, you know, who, who work in the mines, you know, monitor the money, but they're also warriors drawing upon the idea of, um, the Jewish people being, you know, fighters with King David, um, Tolkien openly admitted that, um, I mean, then of course you, you know, you know, you, you have this also Tolkien lived during the, you know, birth of the industrial revolution, I mean, certainly in its height um, in World War One. I, I mean, not the birth of the Industrial Revolution, but really the coming of age of the Industrial Revolution. I mean, you will clearly see this whole idea of industry versus the natural world um, in, oh, in, in Lord of the Rings. You know, where you even have, um, I mean, it's, it's really a communist par- par- parallel with, with Sauron being the Karl Marx white beard, you know, and it, it's workers of all lands unite. I mean, it's really, you know, go- hobgoblins of all parts of the Middle Earth unite to turn, you know, you know, it, it's industry versus the natural habitat. You know, you will find this conflict going on. So, yeah, Lord of the Rings, very deep study, great stuff, very rich in symbolism. Um, again, if you're interested, check out Cinema Symbolism. Yeah, I mean, it has it has the destruction of the environment as well. Oh, and- absolutely. It's it's the encroachment of, of the, you know, the world of industry. Um, encroaching upon the natural habitat. And of course, Tolkien was very upset about this. This was a byproduct of the Industrial Revolution. Um, I mean, you know, you know, you, you get into comparative study with this. I mean, by all means, Sauron, um, or Sauron, excuse me, Sauron is the dark evil lord. Um, this is the Christopher Lee wizard, the Sauron the White. I mean, Sauron the White is Karl Marx. Um, uh-huh. I mean, make no mistake about that. You know, I mean, it's like I said, I mean, this is the guy who wants to, you know, the, 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 the hobgoblins, the trolls, um, you know, these are all the, pro- the, the suppressed proletariat of Middle Earth who, who are going to unite um, to eradicate, you know, the aristocracy. I mean, this is all complete Marxism, you know, uh, the, the, the aristocracy of, of Middle Earth, which is, of course, really the elves. Um, but, you know, the world of men and the hobbits who are sort of the, you know, arist- arist- you know the aristocracy, the elites, you know, the, 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 the goblins, um, you know, these, these are all the repressed, suppressed proletariat. And you have the Karl Marx figure, Sauron the White, 
um, you know, uniting them in, 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 in through the industrial revolution, um, you know, turning his turning the 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 the, the Isengard into the giant blast furnace. I mean, my God, what an allegory for the industrial revolution! I mean, just absolutely fantastic. Great study, Lord of the Rings. Oh yeah, no, I for anyone that hasn't read it, I mean, <clears throat> carve out about two weeks of your time and sit down with lots of good stuff to eat and turn your phone off and and experience magic and what i love is it it is magic but it tells a tale it tells a story it gives you um another you know it's it's not the bible and yet it is a story of birth death and resurrection and oh, um, yeah absolutely absolutely and if you're not religious then then get it from the lord of the rings because basically it is the light does does win out eventually is there sacrifice and struggle absolutely however you know it it does win out in the end um actually uh, uh, you know we, we you've got the exorcists and you've got you know um well back to the future and stuff like that but you've also got in here monty python and the holy grail possibly my favorite english people ever and and how do how does that film fit into your archetypes <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I mean, we have to go back in time really to understand that one. Um, Monty Python and the Holy Grail is one of another one of my all-time favorites. Probably one of my all-time favorite comedies, to say you know without question. Um, this this actually goes back in time to when I was doing Royal Arch of Enoch, um, and and the final chapter of that I took on the um, John Borman Excalibur movie, um, and the the King Arthur story, the Arthurian legend by and large is a solar allegory. I mean, it parallels the Christ story um, immensely. I mean, you know, where you have King Arthur doing, you know, with the Round Table, the Zodiac, the Knights of the Round Table, the Twelve Houses of the Zodiac, or in other in other versions, there's 24 of them, um, you know, representing the dire and nocturnal phases of the Zodiac. So, by and large, the the um, the entire King Arthur, you know, story, the Arthurian legend, is is really an astrological solar allegory. Um, and this is something I broke down in, in Royal Arch of Enoch. And really the best movie to see this in is the John Borman movie, Excalibur. Um, but then we turn to the Monty Python and the Holy Grail, and we will find some of these exact same astrological, esoteric mo motifs um, rubbing off on them. Um, you know, whether this was intentional or, or not is certainly debatable. I mean, we have Terry Gilliam, who, who is a big time member of Monty Python. I mean, who is very much um, interested in Gnosticism. I mean, a, a lot of Gilliam's movies are very, very esoteric. I mean, it, you know, look, you know, we, we, you, you, we talk about the Christ savior, the Christ archetype. I mean, look no further than Terry Gilliam's 12 monkeys. Um, I mean, there is the entire Christ story once again, um, presented on screen. Um, mm -hmm. And G Gilliam, Gilliam is in um, the Monty Python troupe. So, yeah, I mean, with with uh, Monty Python and the Holy Grail, I mean, absolutely. I mean, we have King Arthur um, in, in in you know in all versions of the story is a solar avatar, is a you know personification of the sun. So next time you're watching Monty Python and the Holy Grail and you see G Graham Chapman, um, you know, holding up, you know, standing, you know, riding the imaginary horse with Patsy banging the coconuts. Um, you're going to want to take a look at the emblem on, on King Arthur's chest, on his tunic, um, and it's also on the flag of Patsy. And I, I also believe it's on Patsy's um, tunic as well to see exactly what they represent. Um, and, of course, you know, we have, we have a course, again, um, we're dealing with the Christ archetype. So, I mean, we have, um, you know, he's not always there, but he's there a lot of time. We have the Hermes Trismegistus wizard character who, of course, is none other than Merlin the Magician. Uh, Mer Merlin is, is noticeably absent um, in Holy Grail. So they replaced him with this guy named Sir Bedivere, um, who is the wisdom provider. He's the guy who, um, you know, has all, has all the wisdom. I, I, I liked it. Um, I liked it at the very beginning. This was a very kind of clever trick with astrological archetypes. You have the woman being tried on the giant scales. Um, the, the, the woman, the, 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 the female archetype with Libra is generally a female trickster. So I like the idea of the female trickster, the witch, being sitting on the giant scales of Libra. I thought that was a very clever motif. Um, and then, of course, as the wisdom provider, you have on, on Bedivere's shield and tunic is the tree, the Kabbalistic tree of life, um, you know, Kabbalah, the emanation of all wisdom. So we have uh, the tree um, for, for Sir Bedivere. Um, I mean, it's, it's a great, it's a great movie. I love the one scene towards the end where, 
um, where Arthur and his knights are coming out of winter, the winter months. And of course, um, you know, this is something that just happened. We just had the vernal equinox. Um, so that's the end of winter. Winter's ending. Um, so we're heading into spring now. Um, and after the vernal equinox, um, which is the, you know, which is the end of the sign of Pisces, we head into Aries. Um, so we have King Arthur, the sun coming out of the sign of Pisces, um, leaving the winter behind. So who does he find? Tim. I mean, who's Tim? Aries the ram. I mean, he's got the ram's horn on his head. Um, Aries is a fire sign. So naturally, Tim is fire obsessed. Um, I thought that was a great little astrological motif as well, you know, archetype. Um, so, yeah, I mean, with, with the Arthurian legend, um, if you really want to see the Arthurian legend in all its astrological glory, really take a look at the John Borman Excalibur movie. Um, once you do that and read Royal Arch of Enoch and then read the final chapter, you will completely understand the astrological solar symbolism going on with the um, King Arthur story. But then it turns up again, of course, in the uh, Holy Grail story, but with, Mo with uh, Monty Python, almost unavoidable. I mean, you know, you want to talk about the collective unconscious. Um, I mean, there, there it seems to be living and breathing, in my opinion. Do, do you think the authors have intentionally done all of this? Because it, there's just so much of it in some of these movies and some of these books even that, that you, you know, I mean, do, do you think that there, there is an, a conscious effort to put um, symbolistic characters in books to help people more easily flow into the story that is being told? I think, I think it, I think it's like anything. Um, I think it depends on the car It depends on the movie and the um, book or if there, if the movie is based on a book, I mean, I, I think it depends. Um, I think it has, I mean, I, I wouldn't say there's probably some uniform answer. Um, I just think it depends on, you know, it, it depends on, on, on the movie and, and who's behind it. Um, I think a lot of times it's very much intentional um, I don't believe it's a coincidence. I think sometimes it can be, um, but I, I, I believe it is intentional. But I also, you, you have to give, you know, at the end, you know, you're, you're going to wind up with someone saying, oh, I didn't intend any of this, you know, so how's it getting in there? Um, you know, and then again, we turn to this world of the collective unconscious that we're all, you know, inherited. Um, we, we all inherit this. So, you know, directors and writers and producers are all subject to this as well. So it could be turning up that way as well. But, I mean, clearly when you're dealing with something like The Exorcist, I mean, yes, I believe that's intentional. Um, the Back to the Future material, yes, that's intentional. Um, certainly the Matrix movies, I mean, my goodness gracious. I mean, my, my take on it is, yes, it's intentional, but uh, I'm willing to, you know, understand that also the, these movie makers are are um, being influenced by the collective unconscious. So I am willing to give some leeway to that as well. But I, I do believe that it, it is it is being intentionally placed. Um, and like I said, if I didn't believe that, I probably wouldn't have written the book. Um, so my, my take on it, it, it is being intentional. I mean, when you see the same stuff turning up over and over again, I mean, and it's just so they're, they're so clever with it. Um, and it's so contextual. I mean, that, that's what's amazing to me. Um, I mean, very seldom do you see this stuff out of place. I mean, if it's an alchemical movie, they follow the alchemical, you know, portions of it. If it's if it's an astrological movie or archetypes, I mean, they follow it. The numerology. I mean, I always say, you know, numbers don't lie. Um, and and you know, you know, when the number makes sense in that context, I mean, that that's a dead giveaway um, that these guys are really know, knowing what. They, I mean, I think of. Um, I mean, I think of the one scene in, in the Matrix movie, um, and I, I believe I'm quoting this correctly, but I, I, I may not be. It's when Neo is the Christ Savior, the Gnostic Savior, who's going to wake up mankind. Um, when when, when, when um, Neo is brought aboard the bridge of the Nebuchadnezzar, you're going to see the Nebuchadnezzar's nameplate, um, and it has the, the, the wording on it, Mark 311. Um, I mean, it is a clear reference to um, the Bible verse, Mark 3.11, which basically says, Thou art the Son of Man, and all darkness and demons will bow down before you. I mean, that is clearly investing um, Neo as this Christ archetype Savior. I mean, things like that don't lie. Um, I mean, and, and those are things that really are dead giveaways um, that this stuff is intentionally being placed, and these guys know exactly what they're doing. I would think, too, it it, it is a matter of energetics because it feels to me as though if someone has um 
a spiritual understanding that, that, you know, not standing on the street corner on a soapbox, but if somebody has that spiritual um, flow of energy within them, they attract to them other people who have that same flow of energy. And once you get a whole bunch of people who are on the same page, then magic happens. And, and it, it seems to me that, that a lot of the symbols, especially for instance, in um, the mate, not the matrix, but um, <clears throat> the first one we talked about um the exorcist the exorcist the, the opening scene is is you know it's dark and it's all hallows eve and you know the trees are dead and leaves are blowing around and you get the feeling that something wicked this way comes before you even are into the movie oh absolutely absolutely um you you know you are 100 percent correct on this um, I mean, you have, we'll get to Georgetown, but even when the movie starts, I mean, we have the elderly priest, the elderly Jesuit, Father Marin. I mean, he, he gets the premonition of the demon uh, when he finds the demon's relic um, in, in the little cavern. I mean, then, you know, it's just bad thing after another. I mean, you know, that the clock stops, your time is up. Um, you know, he gets hit with the evil eye, the guy with the one eye, the, the, the death carriage passes before, before him. I mean, these are all omens of, you know, uh, ill omens, but then I love it. I love the scene. I mean, this is kind of over one port, one portion's overt, one portion isn't where he confronts the statue of the demon, um, up on the hill. Um, and then you're, you're obviously going to see the two dogs fighting. I mean, that's kind of obvious, you know, the conflict of good against evil. Mm -hmm. But then I, I love it as the sun setting. I mean, it's the death of the sun in the background. I mean, it's, you know, the darkness is on its way. I thought that was very well done. And then, of course, you get to Georgetown. I mean, you're absolutely correct. With the trick-or-treaters um, approaching Chris McNeil. I mean, it's the death of the sun. It's the halfway point between um, the, the autumn equinox and the winter solstice when the death, the light is in decay. Um, and, of course, this is when the demons come out, when there's no light, um, you know, when the light of the sun, you know, God's sun is diminished and dying. Um, darkness rules. I mean, and literally, um, you know, in winter, the, the days are nothing. I mean, it's all nighttime all the time. Um, and, you know, this is when darkness and evil comes out to play. Hence, you know, evil is allowed entry into Georgetown and into um, the Dahlgren Chapel to deface the statue of the um, Virgin Mary and ultimately the possessed the little girl. You will find this exact same motif in The Shining. Um, I mean, it's the exact same thing years later when the Torrance family um, arrive at the Overlook. Um, the, when, when Jack is meeting with um, Allman, Allman tells him that the hotel's operating hours or years of, you know, months of operation are from the beginning of May and the last day is October 30th. Um, so, yeah. so we know that, the, you know, we know that they're arriving. Um, the last day of business is October 30th. The day they arrive, everything's shutting down. So we know that's Halloween. Um, I mean, it's, it's the same, you know, same thing, darkness, death of the sun, the winter, you know, and now the demons in the overlook can come out to play. It's the exact same motif. The weather, weather can be important in movies. Um, I mean, you want to see a movie where darkness, um, where, where they, where they wreak havoc on your subconscious mind with the weather is the omen movies. I mean, those filmmakers just absolutely will destroy your subconscious mind with this whole play on light and against dark with autumn and winter um, I mean, the entire the entire second Omen movie where the Antichrist is coming of age, uh, Damien Thorne, um, th that entire movie is set. It, it alternates between autumn and winter. I mean, there is no spring or summer. Um, and again, it's the exaltation of evil. It's the Antichrist becoming of age. So hence, the sun is constantly in decay. Um, it, it is a fascinating study, the, 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 the play on the weather um, when it comes to con de de denoting um, light versus darkness. Yeah, I, that that entire um, it, it, it to me is so fascinating, and you know, not every movie falls into this genre, obviously, but but a great percentage of them do, and and I think it's important not only that people understand that that's what that's what's going on in these movies, but it's it's also important for them to understand that that within their everyday life there are archetypes, there are people that they have within their lives or that they meet that fit into certain of these archetypal um, scenarios. And, and, you know, you can look at life that way as well. I mean, not totally, but, but it is an influence upon your consciousness that is an influence upon how you perceive your reality, which is an influence on how you create your reality. 
No, I wouldn't disagree with that. I totally agree with you. I mean, it's really a case of, um, you know, art imitating life, imitating art almost. Um, and it, 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 it is. It's, uh, you know, the, I mean, the way I see it is, you know, mo- movies are made by humans. So in the end, they're a reflection of our lives. Um, and, you know, you, you, could de- you know, you could definitely take the lessons of movies and apply them to real life and vice versa. Oh, absolutely. And, and knowing that, you know, and, and just what archetype do you want to represent? You know, frankly, I don't want to sacrifice myself. I would like to be, you know, I, I don't, I don't need the, I don't need the leading role, but you know, a supporting role would be really cool. Yeah. Um, we're, we're, we're coming up on a break, but after the break, uh, you did something on, on a, on a previous show that we've done that, that was phenomenal. I'd like you to repeat if you can. And, and it, it is done with great reverence, but it is the comparison of the life of Jesus to the life of Elvis Presley, which I thought was just amazing and with no disrespect, oh, absolutely. you know, um, it, because it, it, it does illustrate how, how there is a lesson here and it doesn't have to be a religious one, but it, it really is a spiritual one. And I think it's important that uh, all of us pay attention. There are so many things going on around us that, that give us indications and direction and it's a matter, are, are we going to be ignorant about it and ignore it or, or conscious of it and, and help to um, enhance our reality and, and bring greater understanding and, and hopefully abundance into it? So it's, it's definitely a, a journey that I would like to take. I would definitely like you to go into that. Well, Robert, did you notice the um, Monty Python clip in there? Yes, I did. I I couldn't help but hear it. I thought you were responsible for that. Uh, no. the, um, oh, it's great. Uh, yeah, it's great stuff. I mean, you know, I mean, classic. It's one of my all-time favorites. Yeah, I loved it. Loved hearing it. Just a flesh wound. <laughs> yeah. What are you, What are you going to do? Bleed on me, right? Yeah. yeah, I know that. Great movie. Okay, so, um, uh, you compared during one show that we did a long time ago, um, the life of Christ and the life of Elvis Presley and how they symbolically represent the archetypes. And that was one of the most amazing segments ever done. So if you could repeat that, I would really appreciate it. Yeah, I'll certainly try. Um, It's really a case of Jungian synchronicity. Um, It's the idea that um, a person is sort of given a life to lead that they have no control over, or not that they have no control over, but they were destined to to, to live it or synchronized to it, I guess is really the word I'm, I'm trying to use. It, it's the study I took on in cinema symbolism, and my motivation was for doing was, A, I discovered it. Um, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Uh, but, of course, Elvis himself was in loads of movies. So I thought, okay, well, this is fair game. And uh, it, it was just this idea that... <clears throat> When I was looking at this, I mean, the parallels with, with Jesus um, and Elvis, I mean, and, and just this whole thing with the sun um, was just astounding to me. I mean, it was just one thing after another. Um, I mean, so, for example, I mean, we have, um, you know, I mean, we have Jesus, um, the sun god, the Piscean Age sun god with the 12 houses, the zodiac, the 12 apostles. Um, you know, I mean, you know, comparatively, this is the sun god Apollo. Um, and, you know, Apollo, one of his, he's the god of music also. Um, so we have this idea of Elvis Presley, you know, Apollo the king, um, the sun king, you know, being the god of music. Um, so we have, of course, Elvis Presley, the king of rock and roll. I mean, in Elvis Presley's life, uh, if you're interested in this, again, just check it out in the book. Uh, it's in Cinema Symbolism. But, I mean, Elvis Presley's life is just one solar allegory, reference, um, symbol after another. Um, I mean, Elvis is born in the house of Capricorn, um, which is the um, winter solstice, which is when the sun is resurrected, or excuse me, is born again. Um, so we have uh, the birthday of the sun occurring in the house of Elvis, or excuse me, in the house of Capricorn, which is when Elvis was born. Um, we have Elvis dying in, um, in, uh, in August, which is, of course, ruled by Leo, which is ruled by the sun. So we have Elvis being um, being born, um, you know, in the house of Capricorn, which is the um, birth of the sun, the annual birth of the sun at the winter solstice. Um, and then we have him dying in, in August um, under the sign of Leo, which is ruled by the sun. I mean, then we have this whole um, comparative notion with, um, you know, Elvis um, 
you know, the, 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 the new world, the United States being this, you know, sort of Masonic Republic paralleling Egypt. Of course, the Mississippi River would be the Nile River comparatively. So on the Nile River, what do we have? Well, we have Memphis. And what do we have in Memphis? Well, we have the Temple of the Sun. So, of course, in, you know, what do we have in, on the banks of the Mississippi? Well, we have Memphis. Well, what's there? The, the, the Temple of the Sun, Sun Records. Um, which of course is what made Elvis famous. I mean, and if you know, you you look at you you know you you look at Elvis. Um, I mean, constantly and especially in his later years, um, he he is uh, his jumpsuits had solar emblems on it. Um, the Mayan sun disc. Um, towards the end of his career, this is something I just recently found out, and I'm actually mentioning it in cinema symbolism too. Um, when he came out on stage. Um, he, he came out to a piece of music written by a composer named Richard Strauss. Um, it's called Alzo Sprach Zarathustra. Um, and it's, uh, it, it's, it's, uh, you, you, people will more commonly know it as the theme music to 2001, A Space Odyssey. Um, but that portion of music that Elvis is actually coming out, out to is actually called the Sunrise, of all things. Um, so, so we had that. I mean, then you had the whole thing with the Memphis Mafia, you know, paralleling the, the apostles of Jesus. And then, of course, we have um, the, the death of Elvis. Um, and is he still alive? Um, you know, and, and of course, this is paralleling Jesus, you know, the death and resurrection, um, you know, with Jesus surviving his own death. Um, and it's the same thing is, you know, is, ha, did Elvis survive his own death? Um, and then you have the whole idea of, you know, the, the sacred pilgrimage to the holy, to the holy site. You know, you know the, the journey to Jerusalem to go to the sepulchral church. Um, you know, and of course we see these pilgrimages done to Graceland. You know, where you visit the you know the grave site of Elvis, the collection of holy relics of Elvis. You know, the autographs, the the, the scarves from the concert. Um, I mean, it's you know it's just like this sort of quasi religion almost um, has has grown up around the death of Elvis. I mean, and the, the parallels are are, are really striking. Um, when, when you get into this whole, you know, the whole idea of this cult of Elvis being this cult of Jesus. Um, and, but what, what, it, what really is striking with it is, is the parallels with the sun between Jesus and Elvis. I mean, I mean it is just astounding. Um, and, and it really is this whole idea of Elvis being this New World Apollonian sun god, this god of music, the king of rock and roll. Um, and the parallels between, you know, between Jesus and Elvis and thus Jesus and the son, um, it, it's really remarkable. I mean, I, I, when I was doing it, when I was writing the book, I, I really couldn't believe what I was seeing. Um, and I, to my knowledge, I was really the only person who, who, who documented it. I mean, and, and Elvis seemed to be somewhat um, aware of this. Um, I mean, he, he, is, he is known for being, um, you know, the, the Southern Baptist. But um, what a lot of people are not aware of is Elvis was very much into mysticism. Um, he, he actually, there was a couple times where he actually got up on stage and read from the works of Madame Blavatsky and Manly P. Hall um, to his audience. So, so Elvis was in tune with this. Um, oh, yeah, and, 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 and I want to yeah. make it really clear that in no way, shape, or form are we saying Elvis was a reincarnation of Jesus Christ. Oh, no, no, no. No, uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> it's, it's just a parallel. It's just a parallel. Yeah. Um, no, no, no. It, it's nothing like, like that at all. What I'm saying, it, it's just a, a parallel between these two stories and how, how, how they all connect to the sun. No, no, no. I, I, I do not maintain that either, that, that this was some sort of reincarnation. No, no, no. Yeah, um, no it's I, just I, this I whole want, idea. Yeah. yeah I, I just, I, it, it's not that it's just parallels between the two figures and it's really parallels between the two figures, but it goes back to the sun is, is really what it's echoing. Oh yeah. And it, it's, it was, it's amazing how, when you look deeply enough into so many things, you, you see similarities, you see uh, repetitions of patterns, you see the archetypes being called upon once more, which is, which is profoundly fascinating to me. And, and it just, you sit back and you go, and, and what I love about all of it, and, and the purpose at this point, I think, of all of it is, it makes you stop and think. And, and anything that makes you stop and think and question um, is, is, is an amazing gift because it means that we are, you aren't just gliding by and what other people have told you, you're looking into things, interpreting them and applying them to your own life and seeing does this fit, does this not fit. It's, 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 it's an amazing gift that you've put out there and, and I hope people take advantage of reading just the symbolism books. Um, now, the, the Arch of Enoch, um, whole nother ball of wax, but fascinating. 
absolutely fascinating. I, I, I do want to get into it. I, I, I admit openly that, that when I first tried to read it, I, I got not too far and put the book down and said, I just don't know what he's talking about. And, and so not one to be defeated by the fact that I don't know anything about something. It's, it sent me on a journey of, of educating or self-education anyhow, thank, thank God for the internet, on, on Freemasonry. And it gave me a, such a respect for anyone who goes into the, the higher levels of Freemasonry. Um, and you, you want to explain a little bit about what the, the Arch of Enoch is? Yeah, absolutely. This was um, this was the first book I wrote. This was really the book uh, that was the product of this 20 years of research that, that I had done. Um, it started back for me in, in 1992. Um, the book came out. Um, it's hard for me to believe that the book came out four years ago almost. The um, book came out in August of 2012. But um, the, the thesis of the Royal Arch of Enoch was – um, is, is that this one particular high degree ritual, which when you come to understand it is really pretty much the most important ritual in all of Freemasonry. It, it's without question the most highest, excuse me, the most important within the high degree system. Um, it's the inserted as the 13th degree in the Scottish Rite. It's the seventh degree in the York Rite. Um, when this ritual was being cultivated in Paris, France, um, it's part of the high degrees. Um, it's, it's not part of the Blue Lodge. Um, when this when this ritual was being cultivated in, in, in Paris, France in the 1740s, 1750s, the ritual, its underlying philosophy, its symbolism, its, you know, its theme, you know, you want to call it its archetypical qualities, is was incorporating um, components and elements of the lost book of Enoch, one Enoch, Ethiopian Enoch, um, which technically under mainstream history, under a reading of mainstream history, should not be occurring because one Enoch was unknown to Western civilization at the time. The Book of Enoch, one Enoch, disappears from Western civilization around the second, third century. Um, it doesn't turn up again until 1773 when a man named James Bruce returns to Europe with three copies from Ethiopia. Um, and even at that point in time, they're not translated into English until 1821. Yet this high degree ritual was incorporating components of the Book of Enoch. I mean, it's named after him, for God's sakes. I mean, it's the Royal Arch yeah. of Enoch. Um, and and this ritual is so important because it it, it, it it ties in so dramatically as to what's going on in the Blue Lodge. And, and really, what I was trying to do with the Royal Arch of Enoch, I really wanted to write the book on Freemasonry that I, I believe that if, if you ever needed, I mean, you know, that I wanted it to be, if you, you know, this was going to be the only book on Freemasonry you would ever have to read. Um, was sort of my motivation for this. I mean, I really went into the Blue Lodge. I went into the symbolism. I went into a lot of the, po I mean, there's political symbolism that's going on. There's occult symbolism going on. There's Egyptian symbolism going on. Um, there's astrological symbolism going on. And how this relates to the Blue Lodge, how they relate to each other. When, when you really begin to understand it and comprehend it and understand what's going on in this ritual, um, it, you understand that a lot of the symbolism, the Masonic symbol and the symbolism that's being used especially in architecture in, in Washington, D.C., in Baltimore, with the Erie Canal, with Union College, um, how, why it's all coming out of this one particular degree. I mean, when you understand the lessons of it, you know, you, you will be able, you know, and I do genuinely believe this. I mean, I, 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 I think that you will be, under, be able to see and understand the symbolism, and it begins to make sense to you. As you know, why does, why does the United States Capitol building have a dome on it? I mean, that's intentionally done. Um, you know, you know, why, why is there a Pythagorean right triangle formed between the White House, the Washington Monument, and the United States Capitol, with the hypotenuse being named, you know, Pennsylvania Avenue? Well, Pennsylvania is the Keystone State. There's a reason for that. Um, you know, there's a, there, there's a reason why Pennsylvania is called the Keystone. There's a reason why Texas is the Lone Star. Um, it, you know, this all ties into this occult free, free, free Masonic ideals coming out of the Royal Arch. And you, when, you really, when you really come to break it down and, under, and you understand it, you understand that the United States is really this New World Masonic Republic. I mean, it's so much of the symbolism. I mean, even the formulation of the government is all coming out of the Masonic institution. Um, and, and, you know, this was what the Royal Arch of Enoch was all about, was documenting this, but primarily documenting this historical anomaly, which really the, the book was really the first one to document this anomaly that this ritual was incorporating components of the Book of Enoch um, prior to its discovery in the West. So, so in a nutshell, that's the Royal Arch of Enoch. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, it's heavy lifting. It was heavy lifting. I mean, no, no question. Well, I know, I know that, that a lot of this goes back to, of course, the Solomon's Temple and and the fact that um, they were searching for the for the name of God, I believe. The, uh, well, it, it's it's sort of um, it, it's sort of correct. Um, in the Blue Lodge, in the Blue Lodge, they're building Solomon's Temple. Um, this is what the third degree ritual is revolving around. And uh, the architect of Solomon's Temple is this guy. This is in the Masonic ritual. This is in the Blue Lodge. Is a guy named Hiram Abiff. He possesses the secret name of God. Um, he he alone, and he, he he's the only one who possesses it. As the temple is nearing completion, he is promised to pass this word along. Um, but three three fellow crafts get greedy and they want the word before the temple's completed. Um, they conspire. They threaten to kill him if he doesn't reveal the word. He doesn't give it up, um, and they kill him and they bury him, and he's ultimately resurrected. If you fast forward to um, and, and that that's really where Solomon's Temple um, co- kind of comes into this. But if you fast forward to the um, high degrees, um, they're building the second temple, um, which is the second temple of Zorobabel. It's called. Um, it's named after a Jewish governor, governor named Zorobabel. Um, the name Zorobabel means the heart or path or mouth of Babylon, depending on on how you want to translate it. And it's during this construction phase of the second temple um, that 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 this this treasure vault is discovered that possesses that contains this sacred name of God, um, this lost word of a master mason. It's called. Um, and 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 th- th- this is what the royal arch of Enoch is. It's really the end of the Grail quest. It's the restoration of what's lost in the Blue Lodge. Um, that's why one of the reasons why it's so important. Yeah, and you know, to me, it it I, I think one of the things that impressed me so greatly was that you know after your first three degrees, you you go into the other degrees that are available, and you got the Scottish and the York right being the two biggies. And and they they go into um, further understanding of it, it. It it's a study of self awareness. It's a study of of how do you become a better person, and how do you how do you impact your 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 family and your reality and and your home with these greater uh, with greater understanding, insight, and and wisdom, and. So that so that anybody that that you know, in my opinion, anybody that goes you know beyond the first three levels, um, and that would in the first three degrees are 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 what is called the Blue Lodge, and 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 if you go beyond that, there are all sorts of different. I mean, you could you could assimilate a hundred or more, I would think, um, aspects to the degrees that you have, because there's one that is called um, the Knights Templar which is not becoming a Knight Templar, but it is the name of the degree. Um, and, and from, from what I read about it, 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 it does, that is the only place where at least in, in, um, American, uh, masonry, you have to acknowledge that there is a higher power, but when you get to the, um, the Knights Templar degree, which is I—is that a York right or a Scottish Scottish right? I'm not sure which. It's 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 the it's a body. Um, it's 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 the end of the York right or the Knights Templar. Um, and you know you are a Knights Templar. Um, if you join that, you can hold yourself out as a Knights Templar. Okay, in in the Knights Templar, you have to admit that there's a God, as opposed to. Well, no. In, in order to join Blue Lodge, um, in order to join the Blue Lodge, you have to believe in a supreme being. In yes. order to join the Knights Templar, you have to swear allegiance to Jesus Christ. Okay, um, it's you know for anybody that 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 has you know poo pooed Freemasonry, the amount of study that goes into this material is profound, and the spiritual aspects of it are profound. I think in one of the other shows I said to you that 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 while Freemasonry originated with Masons who were you know, creating the building blocks for Solomon's Temple, theoretically. Um, it feels to me as though the different levels and the different rites are are building blocks of a more spiritual aspect to your reality, and you can't help but be impacted by that. So it is a spiritual journey that you're on. 
when you're oh, in I agree. this. Right? Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. Um, I mean, you you absolutely can can. I mean, I I don't I don't disagree with that one bit. I mean, you can definitely look at. Um, you know, in the, I mean, even in the Blue Lodge, you're being brought from darkness to life. You're being, you're undergoing a symbolic death and resurrection. So the idea is that being reawakened. You're, the idea behind it is the ph- ph- philosophy behind it is, you know, your divine spark has, you know, this is sort of more gnostic than anything, um, yeah. is sort of ignited, and, and now you can affect positive change in the community. So it is sort of a, a spiritual, you know, undergoing, um, being brought from darkness to light. You know, light. I mean, in Christianity, you know, it's 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 the same sort of thing. You can call it being brought from darkness to light. If you want to apply alchemy to it, it's being brought from ignorance to wisdom. You know, uh, Zoroastrianism, uh, Manichaean cosmology, you can call it that also. Um, that's sort of what's going on in the Blue Lodge. But no, you're absolutely right. Is is And the underlying idea behind this is, I mean, I mean, you, you're absolutely correct. I mean, you can definitely look at this as spiritual building blocks. I, I think that is very, very correct um, in, in all this. The idea is, you know, it's probably more so in the olden days than it is today, but the whole idea is once you obtain this Royal Arch of Enoch degree, that by being possessing the secret name of God, you're actually becoming godlike. So the idea was not, not only, I mean, I underline the word godlike. Um, uh-huh. no, no one believes no one believes you were actually a deity. Uh, but the idea was that possessing this word, you became sort of semi-deified. Um, you weren't God, but you were basically, by possessing this word, you were, you know, with what you had gone through the Blue Lodge and now by possessing this word, it was, it was the idea that you, you were expressly given this warrant to not only go out and, you know, that it was your, almost your duty to go out and effect positive change in, in society, um, you know, to, to, to make an to make a impactful decision, uh, an impact on society, a positive impact. I mean, it was almost your express duty to do that um, by, by possessing this name of God. Um, because back in the day, it wasn't, it wasn't, it was much more harder to obtain than it is today. Um, so no, I, I, I do. I mean, you know, you, you, you will find this symbolically, um, being taught to you. I mean, even, you know, we, we go to, um, the Royal Arch ceremonial, there's a part in it where the, the, the Solomon's temple is there and it's rubble. Um, and, and, you know, they, they clear the rubble to make way for the new temple. I mean, again, this is, this, this is symbol, symbolic. The idea is by clearing the rubble, they are now pre- preparing you for something greater. Um, and it's, it's a cleansing, you know, it's, it's your, your, your cleansing yourself. You're clearing the way to make, to make room for this new self that you're going to obtain by possessing this lost word. So no, it, it's all very spiritual. It's all very symbolic. Um, I don't dispute that in any way, shape or form. Um, I would definitely call sort of what, what, what I've described in the book, what I, the way I view it is, is really in the Blue Lodge is sort of what I would call Gnostic revelation, but in the high degrees, it's really, you know, what I call Kabbalistic apotheosis, where the, the candidate, where in the Blue Lodge, you undergo the symbolic death and resurrection where you're brought to light, but then in the, in the um, high degrees, you undergo this change where you, by possessing this word, you become godlike, and you're given this express warrant then to go out and effect positive change in, the, in, in society. Um, I, I don't disagree with that interpretation at all. No, it, uh, you know, when I, when I saw, well, you know, I come from a spiritual whatever. And, and so what, what blew me away is that, 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 that in the field that I'm in, it is predominantly, well, at least in the past, it has been, it's, 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 it's becoming more and more of a, of a 50, 50 split. But when I started in this field, you know, 50 years ago or so, it was primarily women and, you know, it was kind of sad that, that men didn't, you know, you know, they usually men were most, most guys that became involved in it were finding a lot of women, which was, you know, that was a draw, but, but it was sort of sad that there was nothing um, that, that, that men could do without the hormonal, you know, um, contamination of women. And, and, didn't realize that that all along Freemasonry has been there, and yeah, it 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 uh, it it has been an amazing place. And and, and what I love is, you know, the, uh, you don't solicit, you don't go out looking for members. It's a matter of someone has to find it, investigate it, and ask to join. That's absolutely correct, Barbara. Um, you're 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 technically not allowed to solicit members, although it is done. Um, Although in my, my experience with that is it usually doesn't work out. 
Um, I, I, my experience with this is the, the worst thing you can possibly do um, is try to talk someone into it who is genuine, genuinely not interested. Um, yeah. that, 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 is wor- that is meaningless. Um, I have seen that. I have literally seen that happen before my very eyes where um, one, of the elder, one of the older brothers um, has a nephew um, and yet, you know, if, if you're, if you're, I forget what the rules are, but it has to be, I think if it's, if your father's a Mason or one of your family members, you can join at 18. If, if not, you have to wait till you're 21. But anyway, the, the kid has no interest in joining. Um, and he's talked into it by the uncle. The uncle wants him to join. Um, the kid has no interest in it whatsoever. Um, and he does it just to placate the uncle. Um, and this, I've, I've seen it, you know, the, the kid shows up, goes through the first ritual, um, and you never see him again. He doesn't even show up to do the, the other ones. I mean, he had no interest in it. Um, and, and, you know, it, my, my experience with it is it should be, it should come from your heart. If, if it's not there, it's not there. Um, and, and really if, if you're interested in it, you, you, you should take the steps then, um, as we all did, as certainly I did to investigate it. And, and solicit it because um, if you take this, you know, it's the old line, um, you know, knock, you know, the door will be answered, open it and walk through it. Um, you know, and, and you can do it. I mean, anyone can do it. Um, if, I mean, if you're genuinely, in, if you're genuinely interested um, in joining um, the Masons, you can do it. I mean, you know, you, if you know someone who is, that certainly helps. But if, um, if you don't know anybody, um, you know, you could certainly get in, get in touch with a Grand Lodge and talk to them. I mean, and they, they will help you. I've, I've done this numerous times for people um, who are out of state. I mean, I'm here in Maryland, so, you know, I, I can only recommend people to, to lodges here in, in, in Maryland. But um, I, I put people, loads of people in contact with state Grand Lodges um, to help them join. Um, I have no problem doing that. Um, and, and again, it, 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 it should be it should be your, of your own initiative. Um, it, right. It's better it's, that it's, way. It's, it's a matter, and, and as with spiritualism as a whole, you're called to it. And, and yeah. if you're if you're called to it, answer the call. It's it's a fascinating adventure. Um, and and if you're not called, then then maybe this lifetime you're not meant to be called. It's it's it doesn't mean you're less of a person. It just means people are called in different. And and the other thing that I think is so important to actually mention, each each blue lodge is is different. It'll have a different. Uh, a different grouping of, of people in it. So if one blue lodge doesn't appeal to you, there are lots of blue lodges out there to investigate. So um, don't, don't feel they're all the same because they're not. Um, I did want to, I, you know, speaking of masonry, I wanted to kind of go back a little bit to the national treasure films because they do have masonry stuff all over the place there. Yeah, absolutely correct, Barbara. Um, the, 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 it's it's funny, you know. It, you know, it's funny because um, a lot of the interviews I do, I always wind up on the on the National Treasure movies, um, and people like hearing about it. Um, the, I, I thought I thought both movies were really good. I'm kind of disappointed that a third one hasn't come out by now. Um, I would have thought thought so thought so. I, I like them much better than. Um, I, I mean, I thought the first two the first two natural National Treasure movies personally for me, I like them much better than than Da Vinci Code. And angels and demons, but that that's just me personally. But um, no, it, it's National Treasures, uh, an important study because for for a couple reasons. One is it, it, they do both movies do have Masonic symbolism in it. But I mean, you know, the first National Treasure movie um, is a Masonic ritual. I mean, you know, this is a movie that I talked about in Royal Arch of Enoch. I mean, that is the ritual. Um, you know, the Masonic R- Royal Arch of Enoch ritual is you know the recovery or the restoration of the Masonic Knights Templar treasure vault um you know the subterranean treasure vault beneath the holy ground i mean well what's the national treasure movie i mean there it is um you know the 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 discovery of the knights templar masonic subterranean vault beneath the holy ground and i love the fact that they said it in new york uh, that's a definite reference to the royal arch masons under under dewitt clinton um who's a former governor of new york state and a mayor of new york city so i mean just great stuff there um the the, the national treasure movie um both of them are, are very important as well because um those were key movies i mean people forget that you know i mean my god they're, they're over 10 years old now i mean i think 12 years old uh, the first one, I think it came out in 04, maybe 05. But, I mean, the, the, what, those were movies when I saw them. I mean, I was like, oh, my God, here it is. You know, here is this hidden movie symbolism, um, you know, right before my very eyes. And, and no one was talking about it. I mean, so those were two critical movies for me, um, you know, and putting me on the path to um, getting interested 
in interpreting and talking about this occult, you know, veiled movie symbolism. Because I mean, the first Red National Treasure movie um, is a, is a Masonic ritual. I mean, it is the Royal Arch ritual there, right big, right there on the big screen for all eyes to see, and no one noticed it. So it's a great study. Um, I think they're great movies. Um, I, these are movies that I talk about. Both the National Treasure movies are, are movies that I broke down in uh, Royal Arch of Enoch. Well, and it's it's kind of fascinating to me that that when it's meant for material and and um, to come forward into our reality, when it's meant for uh, the consciousness of humanity to be expanded, usually it is in in my in my opinion, usually it happens first subliminally and then it is brought even out into the open and said yes this is exactly the way it is and and you see that with the star trek movies with you know the doors that open and shut for them before they get to them the um the tricorders that they you know they flip open and you know are you know way before our cell phones um and and i do feel that that a lot of this material about opening awareness and transcending into a more spiritual society as a whole is happening in a lot of these movies, but we're getting it in entertainment. We're not paying attention to the message, you know, as a whole that we're getting. And yet there is a tapping on the door, a knocking on the awareness of saying, Hey, do you think maybe this could be? And, and, and the more you get, the more open you are to understanding the message that is coming forward and an awareness that internally is a, awakening to the information that's being fed to us so that at some point there's there's a one of those aha moments that that blows your socks off yeah absolutely um i i don't i don't disagree with that i mean it's it, it's it's a it's a fascinating study and um i mean i just really love doing it um and i i definitely think that you know with this 20 years and and, and research and going through the masonic rituals I, I was on i was on another um show on revolution radio um um hosted uh, by Sol- solaris uh, blue raven uh, the witching mm-hmm. hour and um she, she we, we were talking about it, and i i really do believe that if if, if you i i believe that the, the rituals of masonry and its teachings can be conscious expanding um, I mean, I think it can train you to see things that aren't there, um, and especially if you go through the rituals and then you do the research. I mean, at least for me, I mean, I, I definitely, I, th- I think that you know, going through the Masonic rituals and un- and then researching and understanding it has definitely made me much more um, symbolically aware. I believe my consciousness has been somewhat expanded. I mean, I, I don't I'm saying I use, I'm not saying I use 80% of my brain and I can move things around or anything like that. I just, am so, I mean, when I, when I watch these movies, I mean, stuff just jumps off the screen that 10, 15 years ago wouldn't have been the case at all. Um, and, and, you know, you know, it, it's, 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 it's really just for me, um, help me understand this and, 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 you know, I enjoy doing it. And, uh, you know, it, 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 I, I do believe that, um, you know, masonry, if, if you take the time and go through it and then really come to understand it, um, you, you will really, to me at any rate, that, that you understand that Freemasonry really is this sort of modern day mystery school. Um, but it's different for everybody. Um, and, and for me, it was going through it, understanding what these rituals were trying to tell me, understanding the symbolism, which just opened my mind up to this floodgate, just, you know, op- open the, you know, the, the, the doors up. To, to this, you know, to all these symbols and the symbolic interpretation um, and just applying it now to reality and to these movies and to the architecture. Um, it's just something I've really enjoyed doing and producing books off of it. Now, let me ask you something. I mean, uh, you, you, you know, you've written, you know, now almost two of the sim- symbolism books and, and then the Ark and the Arch of Enoch. I don't know why I keep calling it Ark, but Arch of Enoch. You're writing a work of fiction. Do you find that you are falling into the archetypes? Are you intentionally falling into them? Or are they evolving from the story without your conscious manipulation? You know, it's, it, you know we were talking about this earlier today, and I'm glad you brought it up because... Um, this is really interesting. I'm, I'm writing this first work of fiction called A Pact with the Devil. Um, this story, um, it, it, it came to me. I don't want to give too much of the story away. I mean, certainly once the book comes out, I will. 
Um, but this story came to me in a dream. Um, and when I say a dream, it wasn't something like I visualized them. I was sound asleep. Um, and I dreamt this entire story. I mean, the characters, a lot of their names, um, and, and it, it was something when I woke up, I remember getting up and going over to my desk and just standing there for a while, just making all these copious notes, um, about, about this dream I had about the story. And I really liked it. I mean, I thought it was interesting. I thought there was nothing really like it. Um, and when I went, what happened was this was actually three years ago. In fact, it was almost three years ago to the day. Um, this was around middle of April of 2013. Um, and I'll just take you back in time in, in April of 2013, I was in the height of writing cinema symbolism, um, the first cinema book. Um, and I had this dream and, and I, I, st I, I, I woke up from, from this deep slumber. I, I went, when, when I, what, why this is important is when I sleep, I, I generally don't dream. Um, I mean, but this was so lucid, I mean, and so vivid. Um, I mean, I, I felt like I was like this standing there just kind of watching all this and hovering over, it, you know, being this like omnipotent presence almost. Um, and, and I, I made these notes and I just was just taken in by this. And I, I started outlining it immediately. I started writing it. I wanted to write cinema symbolism. I wanted to get it done. So I thought, well, let me just start in on this, at least start outlining it. And, and I, I did. And I, I, I kind of, if I, if I, if I was writing cinema symbolism and I kind of, you know, wanted a break from it or wanted to do something else, I started writing, writing this other story, which I'm calling a pact with the devil right now. Um, and I, I don't know if it's archetypical. Um, I, I can't think of anything quite like it. Um, I, I, it, 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 it's, 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 I, I think it's very interesting. I mean, I like the storyline. I mean, I don't want to give too much away. It, it, it deals with, it takes place in modern times. Um, it, it, it starts out at Oxford university, which was one of my old stopping grounds. Um, the, the, it is a complete work of fiction. Um, there, there is no person in it, unless it's a public figure that is based on someone I know or anything like that. The characters are complete fantasy. Um, there is one character in it that is based on me loosely, who is an investigator and a writer, of course. So this character is loosely based on me, but all, all, all the female characters, all the other male characters, um, are total fantasy. They're not based on anyone. Um, but it, but it takes place in modern times. It involves a conspiracy. It involves witchcraft. I, I, I had no, no interest, um, whatsoever, um, in, in exploring the idea of witchcraft, um, as a agrarian nature worshiping cult. Um, I was much more interested in the demonic aspect of witchcraft and, and the carnality of it. Um, th this was something that was much, I, I had no interest in writing a story about a witch's coven who makes little hocus pocus charms or curses their neighbors, you know, donkey or something like that. That had no interest for me. I was, I was much more interested in writing a hardcore sort of demonic, um, you know, you know, evil sort of witch's coven existing in modern time. Um, I don't know if it's ar archetypical. I, I, I can't think of anything quite like it. I really like the way it's turning out. It's certainly different. Um, and it, it's, it's what, what, what happened was once cinema symbolism came out, um, I'll just wrap up on this. Um, once cinema symbolism came out, I really started dedicating my time to writing cinema symbolism to, and this work of fiction, a pact with the devil. Um, and what I was doing, I was flip flopping on both of them. I, I'd write on one and then I'd stop. And then for a nice little change, I'd go back and write on, write on the other one. And I just do this back and forth. Unfortunately, once, once I got to both books being around 60% done, I couldn't do this anymore. Um, it, it took me too long to, to go back to flip-flop. I mean, I'd have to go back. I'd have to reread. I'd have to spend about four or five days to reacclimate myself with the book. So I thought, all right, well, this isn't working right now. So what I did was I thought, okay, let me, let me put the, the work of fiction to the side and let me just really knock out the movie book, get that done, get that out of the way, which is probably, like I said, around 85, 90% done at this point. Once I get the movie book done, I can put that on the back burner, start proofreading that, start going, editing that at my leisure, and then delve right back into this, this work of fiction. So that's the way it's played out right now. Um, but I'm real happy with it. I, I don't know if it's archetypical or not. I, I, I don't think it is, but I think in not being that, I think that may be a good thing. Um, at least my take on it. Well, I, you know, from, from what you describe, if someone had said to me, you know, this happened and it's so, so different from whatever, you know, it's not what I intended, but it, it works and I'm happy with it. I, I would say that you've got a sense of, of quote unquote channeling going on 
where higher consciousness, in other words, that part of you that is, you know, connected to the ether and, and whatever, is is giving you a message of sorts and, and you know, a, a storyline that will in many ways, um, you know, put, put something out there of a positive nature for anyone who reads it. Um, and and so you you could call it a text that is in 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 many ways inspired. Doesn't mean that it's part of a Bible or anything, but inspired writing is where uh, a part of a part of ourselves that has greater knowledge, wisdom, and input um, is breaking through the consciousness and the ego and saying this is important for you to do. It's going to expand your awareness and it's going to be in a way there's a message for people in this book so yeah i mean um, yeah yeah i i do believe i agree with that i believe that um you know for whatever reason i believe the story was given to me i'm not sure why um and i do believe that i was supposed to write it um the, the book is very it, it's odd it has some comedy in it i mean it's not all you know completely serious um but it's unique and i i really couldn't think of anything like it and uh there are some aspects of it that I'm just going to keep to myself right now. But mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I, like I said, it, it's, it, it's, it's very, it, it's very, um, I enjoy writing it. I enjoy writing these characters and I enjoy writing their dialogue. And, um, I, I don't think it's anything. I mean, I could be wrong. I don't think it's anything, um, like earth shattering or anything like that. I mean, I, I view it more as like entertaining than, um, you know, some deep spiritual, you know, meaning but i think that's okay as well um you know i i i i enjoy writing it but i don't think i i, I mean i view it as more like uh, entertaining than i do of uh, some sort of really you know like, i mean it, it's not anything like like the royal arch of enoch or anything like that i mean it is fiction um it has you know some very devious characters in it um it has some very dark deeds in it um it has some very eccentric characters in it but um like i said i can't really think of anything that's quite like it and uh it's 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 just different. Um, that's the only way I can really describe it. But I, I do I do agree with you. Um, I don't know why. I'll probably never know. But I do believe that this story, for whatever reason, was um, you know given to me for whatever reason, and uh, I well, thought it, enough of it. Yeah, to to, to it, turn it out. It'll probably take on a life of its own. I have a friend who did a book like like this she was inspired the characters created themselves and yeah yeah that's it, it the characters created themselves and and you know in that case it's coming from a place of um of greater creativity than you have on a conscious level which is a really cool thing and things i i painted a deck of cards and i'm not an artist and it took on a life of its own i think that there are times in our lives when we are comfortable enough that we can put the ego aside and let material flow through us that magic happens and this feels like magic is happening and for whatever purpose i don't know but i will I, I can almost guarantee it will take on a life of its own and it will surprise you. Now, in what way? I don't know. I don't think you're going to be burned in, you know, an effigy or anything like that. But I do feel that there's probably a message there that you don't even realize you're putting into it. So that when they make a movie of it, you'll sit back and you'll go, oh, my God, did I write that? And the answer is going to be yes, son of a gun. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it, it, it's definitely taken on a life of its own. And like I said, I mean, you know, I just don't know where this came from. I mean, it was like there, it wasn't there one minute and it was there the next. And uh, I mean, it was, the, like I said, the dream was just very lucid. Um, I mean, I was given characters names. I was given, um, I mean, some, some of it's of my own creation. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't everything. Um, but I wouldn't wanted it to be like that. I mean, you know, you want to have, you know, some, some input into it as well, you know, yeah. and some, you know, I mean, I mean, as I've been doing it, I've kind of tweaked it here and there and, and whatever, but I've stayed true to the dream, um, by, by and large. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it definitely had for me and it still does to this, this sense of, um, you know, that, that I was meant to do this and that I was communicated this from some, you know, wherever, um, uh -huh. for whatever reason that I may not even be aware of. Now, I don't want you to give anything away, but does this book come to a final conclusion or is it open for a second book? Oh, no, this is definitely open for 
Um, it, it's open for potentially prequels and sequels um, as well. That that's definitely um, you know possible. Well, look at the Harry Potter books. She she took a, a a long time to find somebody that would take a chance on that, and look at the life that that that's those stories have taken on. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, my attitude, what what I'm planning on doing is um, is is you know, it's cinema symbolism too is wrapping up, and then once that's done, like I said, I got to edit in, tweak in here and there, but I'm going to go full fledged into this uh, fiction book, uh, this work of fiction. Um, once those two come out. Um, my plan is at that point is to, to, to do the next Masonic book, which is um, Path to Babylon. Um, that's well underway as well. Um, and then I figure once that comes out, you know, once that's done, uh, maybe I can do like a sequel or a prequel to, to, to the Pact with the Devil and maybe Cinema Symbolism 3, and uh, we'll knock out Interstellar and, and some, some other goodies on that one. So that's kind of what, you know, I mean, you never know what the future holds or anything, but that's kind of the way I'm. I kind of have this, you know, sort of mapped out, but, um, yeah, some symbolism too. And, uh, a pact with the devil, um, they should be out before this year's up. That's amazing. That's, that's, you know, I, I think that I personally believe that when someone is, is in that creative zone, that creative flow, that they open the door to not only what they are planning on doing, but, but other things that, that on a spiritual level, it's kind of like let's put this in too, just while the door is open, and plant the seed and see where it goes. And um, th- that is, anytime I have been doing a great deal of writing, that that you know that I am sort of letting it happen, as opposed to you know uh, outlining it and saying this, 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 and this. That that new material comes out, which which sometimes can be very frustrating because it you know it's not what I intended. You know, this is, you know, I I will sometimes look at things and say, well, that isn't what I intended to do. It's good, but it's not what I intended to do. And, and so suddenly there are many more projects on the, on the burners than, than I had anticipated. And yet they, they almost demand to be done. Yeah, that's right. That's right. It's like um, they write them, the books don't write themselves, but they demand that you write them. Um, and, and it, it, it is, um, I mean, you know, and, uh, I, it's something that I just really enjoy doing. I mean, I just love, you know, writing the, the esoteric and, and breaking these movies down. And now with this work of fiction, um, you know, it's like you said, you know, it, it's see where it ta- see where, where it takes you. I mean, it's, it's not anything I planned, but I figured, you know, some, somehow or another, this thing wound up in my head for whatever reason. And, uh, you know, uh, let's put it out. I mean, it's not hurting anybody. Certainly, you know, you know, no one's, I'm not forcing anyone to read it, but I'm anxious. I'm anxious to get it out there. And uh, I, I think the book is controversial. I mean, you know, I, I, I seem to have this proclivity for, for writing controversy to, to a certain extent. Um, and, and, and the, the work of fiction does have controversial elements in it. No question about it, but so does cinema symbolism and so does Royal Arch of Enoch. So it's nothing new. But, um, yeah, I mean, I'm, right now I'm just plugging along and uh, kind of anxious to get both of them out. But, um, you know, like I said, pro- probably more more towards the end of the year at this point, uh, probably, probably autumn at this point, maybe, maybe a little sooner. We'll see. Well, it's it just uh, things like this. W- when I have gotten into that zone, I found that suddenly I'm living on four hours of sleep and feeling more vitalized than I ever have been before. So, you know, oh, when that's you get true the- too. Yeah. When you get that kind of an energetic flowing, it's it's um, now I've I've not experienced a great many highs in my life. I mean, um, but I I would say that that the creative high is probably the highest possible. It it does nothing but energize you. You feel phenomenal, and you have more energy than you knew existed. And and uh, it, there's no crash and burn. So yeah. It's, I- well, yesterday I spent Easter yesterday writing. Um, I was working on the movie book too, and I was working on the um, my, the chapter on David Lynch and uh, David Lynch. Um, his movies, some of them are very heavy lifting, but um, no, it, it, that that one the, he he Lynch's. Uh, I mean, it was very. I mean, I got a lot done, and I was real happy with it. But I was drained. I mean, I was tired. Um, you know, I mean, and like I said, uh, you know, it, it's it, it, when when you're doing the movie book. I mean. 
what makes it difficult is is you'll be doing it and and you'll be, you'll be writing it and you'll think of a piece of dialogue. So now so now it's it's not only um you know it's not only um you know the symbolism, but now I got to like track down the dialogue. Um, and it, it's constantly, you know, watching the movie again and watching the scene. Believe me, if I could find the scene on YouTube, um, believe you me, that saves a lot of time. I mean, God <laughs> bless YouTube. I mean, if I could find the scene on YouTube, um, I mean, that 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 can be a godsend. But, um, you know, that, you know, the, the you know, I was doing the um, the, the portion of the book on, on the movies that I was doing was finishing up. Actually, was the David Lynch. I was doing four David Lynch movies. I was telling you this earlier today. I mean, his movies are very heavy lifting. I mean, I mean, those things are just you know mind benders. Some of them, um, and uh, but but it came out really well, and I, I was really pleased with it. But it did last night. I was like a comatose or something. Um, <laughs> well, that's know. something that 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 I was kind of curious about too. I mean, you have you have outlined in in at least the one book and and in the Arch of Enoch, and then I'm sure in the other in the next book. A tremendous number of movies. How many times do you have to watch a movie before you're really into grabbing the symbolism and where it is and what it relates to? Oh, multiple times, multiple times. Um, I mean, at, at least, I mean, I have to, I mean, for starters, this study cannot be done in a movie theater. That's out of the question. I mean, I, I, the movie has to be at my fingertips. Um, you know, either on demand or the Blu-ray or the DVD where I can pause it, watch it, fast forward it, go backwards, forwards in it. Um, but no, it takes me usually two, two to two or at least three times to really get a firm grasp. So some of them I can pick up on right away. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, sometimes you'll pick up on different things, um, you know, you know, uh, different themes. This happened with uh, Black Swan. Um, you know, I mean, I mean, that, that, that that's almost like a movie that I'm kind of like scared to watch. And it's not that it's like like a scary movie. It's just I'm afraid that I'll see something new. I mean, it's like it'll never end. Um, you know, and uh, you know, The Shining is the same way. Um, I, you know, it's it's one of these things that every time I watch the damn thing, I seem to find something new or something else new strikes me, and I'm thinking, oh God, you know, this happened to me. This happened to me with the first cinema book. Um, I put it out, and then I was watching Black Swan again. I was thinking, oh God, there's something. You know, I could have put in cinema symbolism that I missed out on. Um, it, it did. It was no matter. I'm covering Black Swan again because there's a whole alchemical storyline in that that I'm taking one in cinema symbolism too. But um, yeah, I mean, you know, you, you know, I, I can con You know, I'm not perfect either. Um, um, I, I just did. I, I mean, my goodness gracious, I don't want to give give this thing away. But there's this movie that came out in October last year um, called Crimson Peak. I don't know if you you've seen this thing yet. I mean, th this thing is just a study in and of itself. I mean, this this is one of, without question, one of the most symbolically overloaded movies. I mean, this thing is is esoteric symbolism on steroids. Um, and I mean, th 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 this is a study in and of itself. Um, and it's in cinema symbolism too. But I mean, I've watched that movie uh, a couple times. I have it here on Blu-ray. Um, and, and it's just every damn time I watch it, I seem to see, see something new in it. So, um, you know, it's, it's multiple times with this. Um, but, 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 but if, I, if, I mean, I have a Blu-ray player, I have a, a PS3, which is hooked up to the internet where this gets frustrating is you put the damn Blu-ray in. I mean, it takes you 10, 15 minutes to just get to the damn menu, um, mm -hmm. o, 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 on the Blu-ray because you got to skip through that. The internet pumps in like ad after ad and preview after preview, of, 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 I mean, it's just constantly hitting the next button, next button, next button, you know, and then finally, you know, 15, 20 minutes later, I'm at the menu, then I got to find the scene select and, you know, you know, but by the time I'm at the scene, I want to watch 20 minutes have gone by. Um, so like I said, if I could find the scene on YouTube and just pull it up immediately, believe me, that, that, that's a godsend. Okay. Well, we're real close to closing here. Your website real fast is... Uh, my website is www.robertwsullivaniv.com. My name is Robert W. Sullivan IV, so it's www.robertwsullivaniv.com. Okay, we'll do this again, Robert. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Barbara. Great show. Take care now. Good night. Mm -hmm.